Good morning. It's Thursday, July 30th, 2015, and this is episode 199 of Tech Talk Today. And my name is Chris, and it's good to be here with you on this Thursday. And it's almost like the internet knew it was TechSnap Thursday. Our first couple of stories are very security-related and big, too. Lots of big things happening, and of course, Russians and Chinese, oh, I'm, oh my, it's all involved, so why don't we bring in our international pan- panel of absolute experts and authorities on every single topic known to man? Why, yes, it's our Mumble Room. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. You give Hello. us too much credit. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Happy, happy science. <laughs> well, you know, it may not be true yet, but eventually, there's probably somebody in that room will qualify. And and then I, then then it's technically true. Uh, so have you heard of Hammer Toss? Uh, according to ZDNet, it's Russian hackers targeting the cloud, things like Twitter, GitHub, and they're trying to spread malware. FireEye is the uh, company that's involved in reporting on this. They're one of the big cybersecurity firms that we've been covering on TechSnap for a while now. So uh, it is pretty nasty since it's using fairly public uh, sites. FireEye has released a detailed report concerning the malware backdoor dub, dubbed Hammer Toss which is able to hide multiple network traffic streams, they say. The group, known as APT2G, has developed hammer, to- hammer Toss to make, a de- to make detection and eradication hard. The group uses online services, including Twitter, GitHub, and other platforms uh, using concealment layers. So basically, I guess they're looking like, it looks like basic traffic um, on these sites. We covered a similar story about a month ago, about a month and change ago on TechSnap, where bots <coughs> were putting natural language comments in Reddit threads, and then the controlled PCs, the, 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 the slave PCs, were reading the comments and getting their instructions. And, and to regular human beings, it just like peop- it looked like people were replying kind of nonsensically to Reddit comments. And this is maybe in, as opposed to like setting up an IRC server and uh, having the, the uh, slave machine get it, log into the IRC, which can be easily blocked and easily detected. This is instead using things like tweets and GitHub uh, gists and things like that to relay commands and extract data from the compromised networks. And it's something we've been watching evolve now for a few weeks. And it's kind of, uh, it's kind of insidious because to the social network guys, it just looks like uh, regular traffic. And the other thing that's kind of insidious about it is it adds a lot of momentum to some legislation that's working its way in the U.S. right now that is designed to compel social media companies to preemptively take action and notify authorities if they think there's terror or terror-related activities on their networks. And so mostly this has been in the form of ISIS-related speech. But now this is adding another dimension. Malware authors are now using these as communication platforms, and it's sort of adding another bit of stink behind uh, this push to uh, actually legislate these companies to uh, take action. Mumble Room, any thoughts on malware that uses things like GitHub and Twitter to uh, control its remote machines? Pretty clever, don't you think? Probably not impossible to catch, though, Don't you? I would also think. Mm-hmm. It doesn't <clears> seem <throat> like anything that's really that new right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does feel like, it's kind of like, a, you, you mean like it feels like a, like leftovers, reheated leftovers a little bit? like Because we've seen this before with like PHP BB forums and things like that, right? So yeah, like hidden message boards, stuff like that. Botnets have been using this stuff for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is just exactly right. It's another version of that. What I found particularly interesting is the timing that it lands when there's this kind of impetus around pushing social media companies to disclose uh, preemptively, more aggressively, and be more involved with the content that gets posted on their sites. Yeah, that's what I was about to mention. That's funny that. It's the, the whole UK thing is 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 seriously going along that line. Yeah. And now and now this suddenly comes out. <laughs> I'm not such a big believer in coincidences like this. I think uh, there's usually uh, some 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 common momentum there. Now, let's move on to something that maybe could help solve all of this. If only we could just read every single Facebook post, every single gist, every single tweet, well, then we wouldn't have a problem, would we? I bet the NSA would like that. Well, we know President Obama would like that, and he's assigned a new executive order to make sure that America has the world's most powerful computer. Now, right now, we got the number two most powerful computer out there, and that's nothing to sneeze at, but China has the top number one most powerful computer in the world in the top 500. So this initiative will primarily be a partnership between the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation, which will be designing supercomputers primarily for use by NASA, the FBI, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Homeland Security, NOAA, and the NSA. Nothing. 
Each of these agencies will be allowed to provide input during the early stage of development of these new computers. Nothing could go wrong with that. Uh, as of June, the fastest supercomputer in the world is China's T-Line Number 2, a computer that runs at 33.86 petaflops, which means it can perform 33.86 quadrillion floating point operations per second. Now, uh, the U.S.'s computer, the second fastest supercomputer, it's at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and it runs at a pretty handsome 17.6 petaflops. So China's clocking in at 33.86 and 17.6, but who's counting, right? Nobody. It's not a big deal. The size of the petaflop doesn't matter. Earlier this year, Intel and Cray won a $200 million contract from the federal government to build a 180 petaflop computer by 2018. So this one that they are now working on is going to be even faster than that one. They say the initiative will be responsible for establishing, will be for establishing over the next 15 years a viable path forward for future high-performance computing, even after the limits of current se semiconductor technology are reached, i.e., the post-Moore's Law era. In, that's in the executive order, in Obama's executive order. How about that? Supercomputers coming. It's going to be probably computers powered by the EMR, EMR uh, propulsion drive we covered on uh, Tuesday's show. I just want to know if it's going to be able to play Half-Life 3. That's all I care about. Got to make sure it can play Half-Life 3 and run OpenGL 4. And maybe if it could support the Vulkan API stack. Uh, now, one more security story, because like I said, it is uh, the internet new. It's Thursday. Trend Micro has discovered a vulnerability that renders Android devices silent. Now, earlier this week, we had the vulnerability that any Android device out there, and if you're listening to this show, I encourage you to go into your Hangouts application, go into your settings app settings, and turn off the automatically loading of MMS messages, because this is essentially an effective workaround for a vulnerability that affects just about every Android device on the market right now that allows their machine to be remotely exploited without really having to take any action. That was on Tuesday. Now, today is Thursday. We have another vulnerability, this one being put out by Trend Micro. They say, we've discovered a vulnerability in Android that can render a phone apparently dead, silent, and unable to make calls with a lifeless screen. The vulnerability is present in Android 4.3 Jelly Bean and up to the current version, Android 5.11 Lollipop. Combined, these versions account for more than half of the Android devices in use today. No patch has been issued in the Android open source project code by Android engineering team to fix this issue as of yet. Um... Now, the vulnerability can be exploited in two ways, either via a malicious app installed on the device, so through the Play Store or sideloading, or through a specifically crafted website. The first technique can cause long-term effects on the device. The app can embed MKV files that register itself to auto-start whenever the device boots, which would cause the OS to crash every time it's turned on. So it's auto-starting an MKV file. Uh, <laughs> That's the that's the that's the hack, huh? Uh, the, yeah, actually, it is. The vulnerability lies in the media server service, which is used by Android to index media files that are located on the Android device. The service cannot correctly process a malformed video file using the MKV container. When this process opens up a malformed MKV file, jeez, the service may crash. The vulnerability is caused by an integer overflow when the media server parses an MKV file. <laughs> jeez, really? That renders so essentially. Uh, if you can get the Android device to try to play this bogus MKV file, um, <laughs> you can you can you can essentially brick their device because it just boots up, tries it, and then it, it dies. Uh, that's that's pretty pathetic. Uh, I guess there's probably <laughs> uh, so they say potential scenarios are common techniques that could be used to lure a user to a malicious site. Um, I, I, just, if, I just I just I just I don't know. I'm I'm sort of. I'm, is Android is am I am I getting too bitter or to me is Android kind of looking like a security nightmare these days? It's just this week alone. It's not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really not good. It's really not good though. I mean, it's like millions of devices in people's pockets now have several low-hanging fruit ways to exploit them if you want to. And there's lots of these uh, Android 4.3 devices out there. This is pretty bad, I think. And, you know, we just recently got around, um, <clears throat> remember Samsung? Samsung, a couple of weeks ago, had that vulnerability where their updates weren't being checked for the signatures, and so you could just deploy a bogus image on the, uh, the device via the Samsung updater, and their fix for that was, well, we'll tweak our policies. So they remotely, through their ser cloud services, tweaked everyone's um, Samsung Knox policies. And that was their fix. Not a code fix, but a Knox fix. And I just... <laughs> And now, now we have this massive MMS flaw, and the fix is, well, go turn off auto-loading of MMS files. You may or may not get an update from your carrier. And now we have this, that uh, Android devices, like half of the Android device, more than half the devices on the market, 
Um, all you have to do is send them a web page with a bad MKV file, and Bob's your uncle, and the device is wrecked. <laughs> I mean, like, it'll reboot. Like, in order to really wreck the device, you're going to have to get that MKV file to start it boot or something like that. But if you just want to temporarily troll somebody, that'll get the job done. And even if they do a fix, most uh, handset providers don't upgrade over the air. So, (laughs) great. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right, Plasma Mobile, we are ready for you. Uh, Anybody in here a fan of... uh, the uh, the UK show, which I never actually, I'm, I'm going to go out, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I never actually watched it, but there is this television show with these guys named Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, and James May. And there was a bit of a drama going on with this show that people love. You guys know a show I'm talking about? Yeah, Top Gear. Yeah, <laughs> Top Gear. And did you hear the good news that uh, Jeremy, Richard, and James are back together with a new Amazon Prime uh, yep. series that's uh, going to be <laughs> launching? How cool is that? Are you super excited? I super never excited. watched it. But yes. <laughs> All right. Who said they were super excited? I did. If you've never seen Top Gear, you should just spend one day just watch those watching episodes. It? It's absolutely yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. The the UK version is a lot different to the American one, and it's far better. Well, so I'm thinking, isn't this is maybe this is the time to jump in now and just to sort of put my support behind this because I'm you know I think this is for me I this is a more approachable online delivery, and I think it's so cool. I. I could you imagine if today, I mean, just the cards didn't line up and the, the cast has moved on, but could you imagine today if Firefly had been canceled? That would be going to Netflix. It's happening quite a lot because Twin Peaks is coming back next year, uh, and that's on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. I would love like another, I would love like another movie or something, but I just, we are in a good time where online content distributors are getting to a position where they can pick up the reins on some of these shows that fans love. And the, because margins online are much different than having to work with t- uh, cable, cable networks and cable companies, it's making it a reality. And it's just super exciting. It's really super exciting. So I'm probably going to check it out. I will, uh, so you think I should watch the old show first or sh- I was kind of thinking of going in clean to the yeah, new show. Yeah. Really? Go, 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 go watch some of the old ones first. Yeah. It's on okay. Netflix too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, well, there you go, there's no excuse. All right, before we get out of here, I will uh, be back tomorrow, but I just wanted to mention our Patreon page over at patreon.com slash today. Help the Jupiter Broadcasting Network accomplish some goals, and we're going to tell you more about those as uh, we get to the uh, preparations for the 10th year of the Linux Action Show, which is a bit off, but we are already beginning to work on it because it's some big, big stuff, and some of that, well, hopefully the ba- the vast majority of that's going to be made possible because of our support over at Patreon dot com slash today. It's also a spot to get behind the scenes info from time to time. I've been a little negligent because I've been so busy, but now that I won't be traveling, well, we're actually going to be traveling, but LinuxCon is going to be in Seattle, so I don't travel very far. <laughs> so that'll be really nice. So now we'll have some a little more time on our hands. Maybe I can get a post or two up there for you patrons. Patreon.com slash today to give us a little runway, keep it weird. And that way we also have the flexibility to tell a sponsor if it's no longer working. No, thank you. And we often say no to sponsors that aren't a good fit because we su- are supported by our community over at patreon.com slash today. Thanks, you guys. Now we're going to wrap it up with an end of show clip. We, on the pre-show today, we're still kind of talking about Windows 10 because it came out yesterday. And we're talking about Cortana. And in the chat room, we were having uh, JB Hawk of Truth brought up the fact that uh, his wife has not really been all that happy with uh, Google Now and its voice recognition and search capabilities. And then we got into a debate of Cortana versus Siri versus all of these and, and even Amazon Echo. And... and it starts to make me feel old because it's like, geez, I feel like we have been around and around and around, and now we are just using today's marketing terms on top of technologies that we have had for a long time. In fact, I'd like to see IBM come out with a product. I think it's about that time in the cycle, because if we go back in the Wayback Machine, IBM was one of the early leaders on this one, and that's what this clip will remind us. See you right back here tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, jblive.tv. Don't know when that is? Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. You do want, did you want something else covered in this show? techtalktoday.reddit.com. Make this show better. Your comments, your votes, your story submissions. Also, Kickstarter of the Week tomorrow if you get them submitted over at that subreddit. Angel B in Studio, Kickstarter of the Week, techtalktoday.reddit.com. Submit it, vote, and we'll pick it. See you then. Speaking. It's one of the most natural things we do. It's also the basis of a remarkable research project at IBM. This is an experimental computer system that recognizes what I say. I talk, and my words appear on the computer screen. It has a business vocabulary of thousands of words, and it even knows the difference between words that sound alike but have different meanings. Watch this. 
Please write to Mrs. Wright right now. This computer system is another example of innovation at IBM. In fact, it's the most advanced voice recognition system of its kind, period.